you know what, this passage in contemporary... See, it's important to study theology and it's important to study history. The contemporary interpretation of this passage about the rock and the sand is basically like this. If you're a Christian, you need to build your life upon the rock. Because if you build your life upon the sand, you'll be an unhappy Christian and your life won't go right. That is not what Jesus is teaching and history backs me up on it. It was hardly ever interpreted that way. Do you know what the interpretation is? It goes like this. There are two ways. There's a narrow way and a broad way. Which one are you on? There are two types of trees. There is a good tree that bears good fruit and is going to heaven. There's a bad tree and you know it's bad because it bears bad fruit and it's going to hell. It's going to be cut down and thrown into the fire. There are those who profess Jesus as Lord and they do the will of the Father who is in heaven. And there are those who profess Jesus Christ as Lord and they do not do the will of the Father who is in heaven and they go to hell. Not because of a lack of works, but because of a lack of faith demonstrated by the fact that they had no works. And then he goes on. This is not two Christians building their house on two different foundations. No, this again is a saved man and a lost man. The lost man hears the word of God preached, but he lays no foundation. You cannot see in any way in his life how the word of God is forming and building and sustaining his life. His life is not... How many people in the Southern Baptist Convention, regardless of all our numbers, regardless of everything we say, if we were to simply take this passage and compare the people to this passage and say, are you building your marriage on the Word of God? Are you raising your children on the Word of God? Are you doing your finances on the Word of God? Are you living separating yourself from the things of this world based upon the Word of God, how many would be able to answer positively? No. None of that. I profess Jesus. He's my Savior. And my Sunday school teacher told me so. Oh, I know, like Leonard Ravenhill, an acquaintance of mine, before he passed on, used to say, I preach in a lot of Baptist churches once. I preach in a lot of places like this once. I could have got up here today with a vocabulary that would have astounded you and preached you things that would have lifted you up and floated you around this room. I could have told you stories that would have made you laugh and stories about dogs and grandmas that would have made you cry. But I love you too much for that. I know... I know because the Word of God is true that there are people who believe themselves to be saved and they're no more saved than not. I know that there are some of you who look around and you think, well, I'm saved. I mean, look, I look like everybody else in my youth group. What makes you think your youth group is saved? Well, I'm like my parents or I'm like the adults in my church or the deacon or the pastor. What does that matter? You won't be judged by them on the day of His coming. My question for you, beloved, my question for you, little child, I mean, you could be my children. And I pray someday when my little boy grows that there will be a preacher who will stand before him and say, Enough of this! Let's get down. What does the Word of God say? How does your life stand in front of that blazing fire which is the holiness of God on that final day, beloved, precious Little girl, beloved, precious young man, on that final day, will your confession hold true? Are you saved? And I'm not talking about, well, I think I'm saved. You know, there's a way that seems right unto a man, but it leads unto death. Well, I feel in my heart of my heart that I'm saved. Well, let me ask you a question. Did you ever read that the heart is deceitfully wicked? Who can know it? Shouldn't you go to the testimony of Scripture? Well, I know I'm saved because my mom, my dad, my pastor, everybody else told me I was saved. Well, I'm telling you this. What does the Word of God tell you? We talk so much about being radical Christians. Radical Christians are not people who jump at concerts. Radical Christians are not people who wear Christian t-shirts. Radical Christians are those who bear the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Radical Christians are those who reverence and honor their parents 
even when they feel like their parents are wrong. Radical Christians are those who do not. Now listen to me. This is going to make you mad. Who do, and I'm talking to boys and girls, radical Christians are those who do not dress sensually in order to show off their bodies. If your clothing is a frame for your face, God is pleased with your clothing. If your clothing is a frame for your body, it's sensual and God hates what you're doing. Everybody wants to talk about a prophet, but no one wants to listen to one. I'm talking about Christianity. I have spent my life in jungles. I have spent my life freezing in the Andes Mountains. I have seen people die. A little boy, Andrew Maimon, the Muslim shot him five times through the stomach and left him on a sidewalk simply because he cried out, I am so afraid, but I can not deny Jesus Christ. Please don't kill me, but I will not deny him. And he died in a pool of blood. And you talk about being a radical Christian because you wear a t-shirt. Because you go to a conference. I'm talking about holiness. I'm talking about godliness. I wish. Do you know what a move of God would be in this place? If all of you came under conviction, if I myself came under conviction of the Holy Spirit, we fell down on our faces and weeped because we watched the things that God hates. Because we wear the things that God hates. Because we act like the world, look like the world, smell like the world. Because we do the very things, and we know not that we do these things because we do not know the Word of God. Because even though we claim as a denomination that the Scriptures are the infallible Word of God, basically all we get is illustration stories and quaint little novels. Oh, that God would blow on this place. That we would turn away from our sin. That we would renounce the things that are displeasing to God, and then that we would run to Him, and we would relish Him, and we would love Him. Oh, that God would raise up missionaries. I don't wish the same things your parents want for you. They want for you security and insurance and nice homes. They want for you cars and respect. I want for you the same thing I want for my son, that one day he takes a banner, and the banner of Jesus Christ, and he places it on a hill where no one has ever placed the banner before. And he cries out, Jesus Christ is Lord, even if it costs my son his life. Oh, when he's 18 years old, if he says to me the same thing I said when I was a young man, I'm going into the mountains, I'm going into the jungle. And they say, you can't go there, you're insane, it's a war, you're going to die. I'm going. When that little boy puts on that backpack, I'm going to pray over him and say, Go! Go! God be with you. And if you die, my son, I'll see you over there and I'll honor your death. Oh, my God. Let's pray. Let's pray. Oh, God. I don't care about reputation. I don't care what men think. I want you to be honored. I want, I want these young people to be saved. I want those that are saved to stop looking around them at a cultural Christianity that you hate and will spew out of your mouth and that they will look at the Word of God and say, I will follow Jesus. Oh, God, I pray for youth ministers and pastors, and I pray that you'd fill them with a spirit of wisdom and love and boldness and discernment. And dear God, whatever the cost, I pray that you would raise up missionaries. I can't help but look at these kids and think of my own little boy. Oh, God, that you would save Ian and that you would raise him up and send him into the worst part of the battle. Oh, dear God, raise up missionaries here. Raise up missionaries, raise up preachers and pastors and reachers and evangelists that know the Word of God. Oh God, work in this place. Please work in this place, dear God. Please. 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 Now with every head bowed. Is there anyone here tonight that would say, Brother Paul, I have been living a lie. I claim to be a Christian, but I love the world, and I look like it, and smell like it, 
and I hate myself for it. And Brother Paul, I am so tired of this Christianity that I'm living. I'm just sick of it. I'm just sick of it. I want to be saved. I want to be saved. I just want you to stand up. Brother Paul, want to be saved. Amen. Is there anyone else? I want to be saved. Amen. Amen. In a moment, we're going to have an invitation. Those of you who stood up, I'm going to come down here, and I want you to meet with me. I want to talk to you. Now, you may be seated, thank you. Now I want to talk to those of you who claim to be Christians. Does your life honor Jesus Christ? Are you looking in His Word to find out how you're supposed to live? I pray with all my heart. The only thing that's going to save the church in America, there's only two possibilities. One is a total reformation in our preaching, in our study of the Word of God. Or the other is fierce, horrifying persecution. That's the only thing that's going to save the church in America. Oh, I pray. I pray that you would return to the Word. I pray. Listen to me, young person. You, you need to know. You need to say, okay, how am I supposed to live before my parents? Go into the Word, find out, obey it. How am I supposed to dress? Go into the Word, find out, and obey it. How am I supposed to talk? What am I supposed to listen to? Bring every thought, word, and deed into subjection to Jesus Christ. Now, I'm not going to ask you to stand. Because I am so tired of people coming forward to make those commitments, and those commitments last in two minutes. I'm not here so that I can write up in my magazine that a gazillion of you came forward. I want you to go home, and I want you to live for Jesus Christ with all your heart. But if you need counseling, you say, Brother Paul, I want to. I want to live for Jesus Christ, but I don't know how. I don't know how. In a minute, we're going to give an invitation. I do want you to come forward. Not to make a commitment. You want to make a commitment? You make that commitment right where you're seated. You need to tell somebody, you go tell your pastor. You go tell your youth minister. And you know what? We'll know if that commitment lasts. You know how? Because it will last. We'll know if it's from God. Let me tell you something. For everyone who's here right now, I want to tell you something. If you made a decision to follow Jesus Christ, if you made a decision to get saved in these last two days, I want to tell you something. If it was genuine, it will last. If after a few weeks you go right back into the world, live like the world, act like the world, I want you to know something. You didn't get anything here this weekend. You got emotion. That's about it. If you really got something from the Lord, I want you to know something. It will last. And even if you try to run away from it, you won't be able to do it. You won't be able to do it. Oh, I love you so much. I love you so much. I would ask that we all stand. If you need counseling about a decision that you have made, but it's not clear, I want you to come forward. And I'm going to come right down here. Those of you who stood up, there were many of you over there, who, who say, I need to know Jesus Christ. I want to come down here right now, and I want to meet with you, and I want to go back over here with you and some other counselors, and I want to talk to you, and I want to tell you something. Not a five-minute deal, not a ten-minute deal. If you need to talk all night, we will stay. That is the attitude of every counselor in this place. It will stay all night if necessary. All night. God love you. God love you. Let me pray for you. Dear God, please, Lord, there has been so much movement. Last night, Lord, I don't know how much of it was real, but I know that I saw people last night weeping. I saw people trying to make commitments, and I believe that there was a great deal of what happened.